Hello, and welcome to week 14, where we're going to discuss more modern humans. So uh, we've moved out of archaic humans. We've even um, jumped into uh, agriculture. Um, there are some interesting finds that are going on now. We've found evidence of uh, human beings in Israel uh, that it looks like they were farming um, like proto-wheat and proto-barley. Uh, in that kind of fertile crescent area at about 10 or sorry, 20,000 years ago. Um, so we're backing dates up in terms of, of cereal grain usage. What I would tell you is that cereal grains have been, um, used longer than that. They were just considered not a primary source of people's diets. Um, I have a couple, uh, one video that goes over, uh, the early people who start to farm and use cereal grains. Um, almost as part of a primary diet, and it talks about them settling down that then leads into uh, Katalhiuk, which is our first example of a city and sedentary lifestyle. Um, the Katalhiuk article is, is fairly long, but it has it has illustrations and pictures, So, um, but it is excellent in terms of its descriptions on uh, human change, diet, and those kinds of things. All right, so over the last 10,000 years is really when we started to, to, to get into farming. And again, this happens over certain parts of the world. Um, again, when we talk about the Fertile Crescent, we're really talking about Mesopotamia area, and then we get into Egypt, um, that, that area, but then also uh, South Asia, um, the Indus River Valley, and then East Asia as well. And then we have New World civilization developing. And when we talk about civilization, we're really talking about sedentary lifestyle, people settling down, living in one location, and then also like people living urbanly. Um, and so really what you get is a uh, division of labor. So then people are specifically, you know, you have hierarchies of power. You have a pharaoh or a king um, that is passing down power through bloodline. Um, and you have uh, farmers who are preparing grains um, and working in the fields all day long. Uh, work time goes up immensely. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then you also have like accountants uh, tax collectors, all of that division of labor gets built into uh, so-called civilization. And really what we should probably distinguish is the difference between civilization and the state. Um, civilization happens around Katalhiuk um, in terms of uh, urban living, um, more division of labor, agriculture. Um, but when we talk about the state, then you add in things like taxes and some of those other things that were not there originally. So um, those are cultural, sociopolitical, economic realms of humanity. Um, but all of those things have impacts on our biology. Again, it's that biological, cultural, environmental feedback loop. Um, and we really need to kind of focus on that feedback loop for today. Um, some of the things that have happened over the, the, 10, 000, the last 10,000 years are that we definitely have more uh, examples of crowded teeth. Um, and it has not always been a problem for us. So essentially what's interesting is that our mouths are shrinking, uh, but our teeth haven't actually shrunk to that level yet. What I will tell you is that some people are now born without wisdom teeth. So that's making up for that structure. Teeth take energy, but they're very hard. Um, and evolutionarily, we don't lose the thickness or the um, structure of teeth as fast as our mouth has changed. So as we start eating more soups and other things, our mouths might change, but our teeth are actually kind of holding on to this evolutionary past. Um, and then due to the dietary changes from the wild fresh foods to agriculture and to processed foods, this has come about, right? And, and food, um, I just said food can be softer. And that's because we've started to, um, during certain times of our evolutionary past, we've, we've started to increase um, more and more things like soup. What I will tell you is that this is... Um, this is based on culture. So when I say food is not softer, in some places food is softer. Um, but when we look at overall pictures of, of food around the world, um, it might not kind of average out. So I think there's some interesting um, almost contradictions in a way. Um, but some groups of people really, uh, their main source of food is, is soup. And in our, in our, in our human past, it, that's also true. Um, but I will also tell you that that's, that's kind of interesting that that many biological anthropologists probably fail to include here is I, I would consider our food actually being 
um, softer in a lot of ways because we are currently we've eliminated out the granular rock structure that used to get added into our food when we turned grains and or nuts into flour. Uh, for instance, Native American peoples, uh, when they would use the mortar and pestle, uh, they would have ground uh, basaltic rock um, up as a pestle into the, the ground rock mortar, um, creating kind of a bowl within the, the stone. But when you're doing that, you're basically breaking off stone. So, so when you consume the flour, now you're actually chewing on sand. Um, and so I would say that, that um, during this time period, it was important still to have very hardy teeth. Um, and, and so I would say that, that the biological anthropology, which is, which is kind of on the screen here that says food is not softer, um, we have to go back in time, right? So once we started cooking our food, food became softer and, and more digestible. Um, and then certain groups started to utilize soups. Um, and then as we've started to pull out sedentary or sedimentary stone and or um, uh, rock, uh, sand, those kinds of things out of our food production, food has gotten softer. Um, but we haven't necessarily changed the style of food that we're eating, right? Um, 10,000 years ago, we were eating bread. We're still eating bread. Um, so again, I think that that's some interesting kind of debates in the field. So. Um, uh, go ahead and research that in different parts of the world, um, different types of, again, it's culturally based, what, what types of, of food, softness and hardness people are, are consuming. Um, malocclusion is two forms. There's two forms of that. There's the underbite and overbite. Again, I would say this has a lot to do with that, that mouth structure um, and uh, the teeth staying kind of pretty hardy. Um, so the agriculture revolution, uh, to be honest, is vitally important to our past. Um, I don't think, I think that it's important to realize that it did not happen all at the same time. Uh, there are theories in the field that think that the Inca and people in Mesoamerica, the Olmecs, and even before the Olmecs had farming uh, before uh, the new world. Now, what I will tell you is again, this is, this is not a, in history books, we like to delineate these things with, with hard dates. Um, the agricultural revolution was over a, a period of time. And what I mean by that, if we have evidence of, of people in Israel starting to, to farm cereal grains more heavily, um, and what I mean by farming, I'm not talking about giant fields, I'm talking about horticulture, right? Like small gardens or some of those things. Um, but if that's 20,000 years ago, we typically don't talk about the agricultural revolution until 10,000 years ago. So there's a, there's a process there of becoming more dependent and more sedentary, and it's over time. It's not... Uh, like a, a set delineation. Um, for instance, um, groups in Europe didn't start farming really until, you know, 3,000 to uh, 5,000 to, to 3,000 years ago um, in, in Northern Europe. And then, and then, you know, Native Americans didn't start farming until, you know, a thousand years ago. So we have delineations throughout time. Hunter gatherers still exist on this planet and there are people who don't farm. So that there's realize that it's much more complicated than that. Um, but I think it's important to talk about the agricultural revolution in that how much did it change the world? And that's really what we're talking about with the idea of revolution, right? How much did full-blown agriculture, where you move from kind of this picture of hunter-gatherers into staying in, in set locations, usually cities, um, having animals around you all the time, and then also then going to work for long hours? Um, in the video, there's some, some great stuff. It talks about um, an individual working for four weeks or something like that, um, is able to gather enough food for the whole family group for a full year. Um, now imagine that, that that is essentially not a lot of work. So then the question should be, well, well what, what happened? Why did we decide to move to this 40 to 60 hour work week and all of this other structure? And I will tell you that this happens during uh, the state process. And what I mean by that is, Again, civilization can exist. You can live in a city. Uh, you can have agriculture. You can have the, the food products that were used to bread, those kinds of things. Um, you would have had a more balanced diet. But once the state comes in, you get hierarchy. And Catalhuyuk was actually an egalitarian uh, city, uh, city civilization without the state. So there's some interesting kind of things there. Once the state comes in and you start collecting taxes um, and you start to build borders and you start to have uh, full-time military personnel, and priestly class and uh, hierarchy of power, um, those things start to dictate pretty much how we live. 
Um, so again, uh, the state and civilization need to be separated. And there's this great book by James Scott called uh, Against the Grain. I recommend it for, for people who are really interested in this time period. Um, and it goes back kind of 3000 BCE um, to the city state of Uruk in Mesopotamia. Um, so agriculture revolution is there's going to be some shifting. So hunting and gathering moves um, from more uh, intense fishing and shellfish capture. So there's there, what happens is as the, the climate changes, which is another important, that environmental component starts to shift. Once it becomes wetter and warmer, uh, it creates the perfect structure in certain areas of the world for agriculture. Um, so again, now, now things are reseeding themselves. You don't even have to plant them. It's like horticulture gardens where you just kind of leave them alone um, and they just reseed right every year. Um, when it was colder than that and it was uh, less wet, essentially the the grain products weren't able to receive themselves so the, so this is the environmental component and climate is really setting us up for uh some of these these developments that happen and humans are going to take advantage of them in the way of creating what we would call civilization right um and so i think that this is this is also very very important um domestication of animals happens because now that we have more food and we can store grain now we can feed animals and keep them around. Prior to that, it would have been, it's kind of wasteful. And by the way, um, farming animals has its own sets of problems. Uh, one of those is that, um, that essentially they are, they're a lot of work and they can pass disease to us. So I think that it's super important to realize that um, this domestication process with animals only happens because we're able to actually create a surplus of grain storage. Um, and so again, I think domestication is it's converting wild animals and plants into uh, things that humans can form and, and cultivate. Remember also that during this process, process of what we call domestication, when we domesticate animals and plants, which is essentially a control structure, we're no longer going to be dependent necessarily on the earth and the climate and the environment. We are going to try to con control our future through growing food, through rerouting rivers if we need water, even during times of drought, those kinds of things. Um, and again, that control process actually in, in, in forms of us domestication or domesticating other things, we domesticate ourselves. And what I mean by that is we used to have a lot more free time, individual time to go off and wander, play in the river, whatever else. Uh, we domesticate ourselves in that now that we have animals around, now we have to constantly feed them and take care of them and, and look after the crops and 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 rodents and all of those other things. So now what we've done is because we have them domesticated, we've domesticated ourselves in terms of work time. Um, so I think that that's an important kind of factor here. We also division of labor, right? Then we have classes where we have people who might be called farmers or peasants, and now they're the domesticated uh, working class, right? So there's some interesting uh, side notes that biological anthropologists study in terms of our biology as well. Um, uh, let's see, cultural and environmental Im implications of agriculture. When we start to keep, um, when we start to keep animals around, uh, we also increase our, our, uh, our likelihood of getting disease. Um, and it's a lot of combinations. So for instance, swine flu and bird flu, those are things that we developed because we started to keep those animals closer to us. Um, and by closer, I mean like right next door or in our kitchen or in our, you know, in, in our house, the, the, the structures of animal husbandry, which is what domestication of animals is called, um, really leads to all of the diseases that we have on the planet, essentially. Um, and from everything from malaria to the flu that we're dealing with right now, um, that's from, from animals mixing kind of different viruses. Um, and a lot of it comes down to, to farming. And in the past, and, and right when we, that we don't have them in, in hunter-gatherer cultures, the new world essentially had none of that. Um, it did not have uh, influenza and and uh, the poxes and uh, STDs and all of that structure. It just did not have those. Those are coming from the old world from a long period of agriculture and domestication. So I think it's important to, to realize that as well. So the predictability of agriculture, this is the big one, right? Like it increased the security around food availability. So now we can... Uh, this also changes our view of future. So when we're uh, hunter gatherer groups don't necessarily have a time structure, they talk in the present um, because everything is in the present. Gathering is present tense. Um, but again, I think that it's interesting because agriculture creates a future tense, right? How much food should we plant 
in order to uh, harvest it. 